Yesterday's election was a tale of two planets with a world of difference between Boston and much of the country. Joining us with some thoughts about the results are political consultant Choice Ferrabo Bowling and a reporter with Politico Massachusetts, Lauren Dzenski. I'd like to thank you both very much for being with us. Thanks, I, I want to start with uh, the surprise. Uh, I was sort of, Joyce, how surprised were you about the way things turned out? I was not surprised. I was stunned. Uh, my son and I were on the phone. He's over at UMass Dartmouth. And he was like, Mom, how do you just give up Wisconsin? I said, what are you talking about, give up Wisconsin? He said, she never went to visit Wisconsin. Um, and they took her over the hump when she was um, for the primary. And I was like, oh, my God. And then we kept watching, and we saw Michigan. We saw Pennsylvania, where there are huge populations of people of color votes. Now, I know that people of color were not super enthused. I'll be honest with you. Um, many people of color feel like they're taken for granted uh, a lot of times by the Democratic Party, and that was hammered by uh, Trump. And I know that they probably thought bringing out Obama and Michelle and Jay-Z and Beyonce may have helped them, you know, sort of rock the vote. But I think that, you know, there's still retail politics needed, even when you're doing um, nationwide. And I don't think that they engaged it in, in it to the degree that they needed to. And, and the fact that Trump really pinpointed an angst that he just hammered in. Um, and I was just, you know, as a person who's worked with women's groups, I was stunned that 52 percent of all women voted for him. Um, again, another group I think might have been taken for granted. You have to massage these things. It doesn't, you know, happen like by osmosis. Lauren, what about you? I, I mean, did, did you totally buy into uh, what Michael Moore was saying? Because he, he was spot on about this. I mean, I, one of the things that has kind of been brought up um, is that Clinton, I think for so many people, she was seen almost as the presumptive winner, you know, of, of the election. And, and that was also true in the primary. And so there was a certain level of vetting that Donald Trump got to have in the Republican primary with so many different people that allowed him to really specifically appeal to these voters and win over so many people that Clinton just simply didn't have. Mm -hmm. To a certain extent, she, she wasn't able to capture the zeitgeist of the Democratic movement. And, and we really saw those shortcomings. It was amazing watching polling and returns coming in last night where, you know, the, the estimates all of a sudden that had been locked down for Clinton all of a sudden started trending toward Trump as, as you know, polls started closing. And I think a lot of that was because the Trump campaign was talking about how they were close in a lot of these states, but the Clintons and the Democrats assumed that they had it locked up. But there were just those those hairline cracks that ultimately resulted in the breakdown of that democratic firewall that Clinton just needed to secure. But I, I mean, I think that it's fair to say that a lot of us are, are really surprised at the result of this, no matter where you stood, um, you know, for either candidate. I, Trump's win, I think, is an unprecedented uh, time in American political history, perhaps, you know, in, in our nation's history, full stop. Joyce, what, what about those Rust Belt states where I thought it was less likely that, that Trump was going to win, especially Wisconsin, maybe Michigan? Well, I, I need to kind of say this. I, I think that um, he tapped into an angst and an aversion to the kinds of political um, machinations going on between both parties, between the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. Remember, he ran against the Republican establishment, you may as well say. Uh, it, it's funny to see Paul Ryan today acting like he's his new best friend. Um, but, you know, I think that a lot of people in the Rust Belt and other places, they just felt like, hey, my insurance policy is going up. I can't get jobs. I can't get my folks, and they're fight, you know they're fighting back and forth. I think people wanted a clean sweep. You know, it's kind of really funny when you know he talks about change because you know that's how Obama came in, and Obama didn't was not as politically seasoned as Hillary, but he beat her. Um, but then he got in, and the Republican said, "Well, you're not going to be able to do anything here," and now I think that people. Uh, 
want someone who just may not be as seasoned in, po at, in politics, who can kind of look at uh, the situation with a, a broader uh, view. Now, again, I believe that he's got not the greatest temperament, but I was pretty shocked at how gracious he seemed in his speech. So maybe it's a, uh, like a new day. I don't know. We're talking with Joyce Ferrovo, polling political consultant, and Lauren Jasinski from Politico, Massachusetts. Lauren, talk about some of the uh, the groups, the voting blocks out here. Uh, millennials, I guess uh, Hillary's supposed to be struggling with them. Uh, how did it turn out? So, at least as, as as far as I've understood the numbers, it seems like millennials turned out in in far greater numbers for Hillary Clinton. Um, but again, she she didn't lock down. Uh, these voting groups by the margins that she necessarily needed to. Another thing that while we all kind of understood um, the Electoral College and the Electoral Map to be inclined to, to Clinton's favor, um, she still... It, it appears that she's going to win by the popular vote. So, so really, Donald Trump was the one that it, that benefited from the setup of the electoral college, at least right now. So, so it's just really fascinating because we're sitting here, we you know, going into election day, going into election night ahead of the polls closing. It seemed like this race was so obviously decided one way, and and the fact that it's it's completely the opposite, I think, is really fascinating. Um, one thing that. I think is going to be really fascinating going forward is look at whatever you want to call Donald Trump's mandate and his victory and the margin by which he won. And, you know, yes, he secured, you know, I, th I think it's over 300 votes in the Electoral College, but, you know, looking at the popular vote, it doesn't look like he locked down the popular vote. How can he use those two numbers and you know, really bring the country together. I think everyone on either side will agree that this country needs to come together if, if we can, you know, grapple with a lot of the problems that both campaigns, um, you know, pointed out. And, and I'm really, really curious to see how a Trump administration does that. Joyce, be, be, before the vote, you know, we all thought of uh, Trump, uh, like him or not, uh, as the dynamic figure with no organization. And, and Hillary was just the opposite. And, and it, I'm not so sure that's true. Well, let me just say, uh, I think that a major difference uh, was people skills. And I'm not saying it in a negative kind of way, but, you know, he studied people. He studied, you know, he was more, you know, the retail politics guy. I mean, he was doing like maybe five rallies to her two sometimes, but his instinctual connect to people, maybe because of his shows and all of that, and his business dealings. He's a reader of people. And so I think that uh, he played that core much better than Hillary did, because you don't lose Wisconsin, who took you over. She hump. was never there. You don't do not court women, even though you th you are a woman and you're histor history making woman, and you don't court your most uh, loyal uh, African Americans and uh, Latinos. I mean, she should have been ha her people should have been working them on the line. Not it shouldn't have been one last minute. Oh, they've all come out. No, it should have been a steady like you had you know surrogates and everything. If she thought Jennifer Lopez was going to do it. Uh, rock the folks to the uh, polls, you know, and I got it. You you do vote your personal, um, you know, values, and you know he was very insulting to the immigrant, um, you know, population. But you still have to work it. It just is not going to happen by osmosis. It just isn't. What, what about you, Lauren? Do you, do you think that she should have been more forthcoming, uh, and maybe maybe less risk averse, and trying to get out there, stir up her base? I mean, I, I think that if if there's one thing that we can use to define Hillary Clinton is that she is generally risk averse in in that sense. However, being the first female candidate uh, to to you know get this far in the presidential contest, obviously that that is uh, opting toward risk. Um, however, I, I think it was I think it was a difficult needle to thread for the Clinton campaign. You you, you want to boost, um, you know, the you want to deal in the woman card without being too blatantly, you know, 
pandering almost to it. Um, and I think it was, you know, a really difficult kind of move for the campaign to figure out. And, you know, as, as we saw, I, th I think the contrast between the two campaigns, we saw multiple, you know, reworkings of messaging from the Clinton campaign, different uh, changes of the slogans, things like that. I think what Stronger Together was probably the fifth iteration. Um, however, the, the campaign was still, you know, highly organized, there was never any reports of, of internal infighting or backbiting, and yet contrasted that to the Trump campaign where it was chaos all over the place and ad buys being made in one spot and then you know pulling money back. And um, I think, I, I almost have to wonder how shocked the Clinton campaign is. I mean, obviously they have to be, but considering what they were up against and, and the apparent lack of organization, I don't, I don't think that I think that the Clinton campaign kind of saw it not necessarily as a one-to-one -one campaign. It almost feels like it was like a, they were fighting a guerrilla war, right? Where where the people that they were uh, up against were just so unexpected and you know just kept surfacing in different spots that you know they couldn't ever really anticipate that. Joyce, what do you see in, in, in Clinton's results with, with women and people of color? Well, I need to say that too, and I agree with Lauren. But you know, I remember when um, Governor Patrick um, said a long time ago when there were just rumors of Hillary running. Um, that you should not come across as though you're the, you know, presumptive, you know, the baton passes uh, to you. And I think that a lot of people saw that. Um, as I said, you know, as for the women's vote, I have to tell you, I'm, I'm really saddened by that because it took 90 years to get here. Let's just hope it doesn't take 90 years to have a woman uh, president. That that's that's a setback to the to the women's movement. That's what I feel. I really feel that way. We're, go ahead. Um, another thing, kind of worth noting to be considered in the context of all of this, is that to a certain extent, Clinton had an uphill battle. Even though you know the the electoral college map at least appeared to be in her favor, the simple feat of pulling off a third term of a Democratic president in and of itself was extremely difficult because after two terms of President Obama, so many voters simply want to look for a change candidate. And Donald Trump, just simply by virtue of not being an extension of President Obama, that for so many people was, was simply enough. They wanted to see something different. They wanted to change things up, whether or not they actually believe in, you know, as Donald Trump says, said at his rallies, in draining the swamp. Um, this is still change that, that these people want to see. Well, with that said, I want to make one point, and that is that people keep connecting her loss to uh, Obama's legacy. I don't buy that. I would argue against that strongly. Look, he, his wife, uh, you know, tried the best they uh, could. I mean, uh, but the, you know, wave of change um, that she did not see um, was just too great. Trish, I want to ask you about the results on the uh, charter school expansion question two. Uh, mm -hmm. I thought that was going to be closer. It wasn't close at all. No, I didn't think it would be close at all. I mean, I got you, the governor went out and he's a very popular governor and so forth, but there's a common perception, well, maybe not so common, that, you know, you know, financing and doing more charter schools is a, a kind of Republican-like uh, culture kind of thing. Um, and frankly, the one thing that I felt about it though, even though I knew it wasn't going to, uh, I, I knew no was going to win, is that we have got too many failing schools and no one has said, this is the last time we're going to let this happen. We want those level three, four, and five schools uh, dealt with because no child should go to a failing school. Or why do you think uh, it lost? At the end of the day, the charter question was so complicated. There was so much money, there was so much time and effort that was put into messaging this uh, on both sides. But at the end of the day, I, I just really don't believe, and I think the voters and looking at the, the results as well, 
voters just never really understood why changing the law and changing the status quo to, to add more charters would make things better. Um, even just simply reporting the issue, the more I delved into the charter question and what it would mean and the way that the law is written, and um, it kept dredging up more and more questions about the state's you know, education funding formula and things like that. And I think for most voters who are quite overwhelmed with, with the issues and kind of how things work, that's a lot to tackle. It and is. so to basically be able to say, all right, Things are fine now. Schools in Massachusetts are good for the most part. Obviously, not all parents would agree with that, but you know, by and large, things are pretty much okay. We're just going to keep things as they are. I, I think that's really you know how how we can interpret those results. But you know what? We have some great charter schools, Neighborhood House Charter, um, Match, um, Brook. Um, it is a, very sad that the battle is over funding. I think. Somebody needs to figure out a way, because I think the schools do need competition, but it, it turned into such a mud wrestle between the two. I don't think anyone benefits from it. Well, finally, uh, both of you are going to be getting into some more discussion about this tonight. Joyce, what's the event? Because I know Lauren's going to be uh, taking okay, part. Okay, um, it's uh, Mass Women's Political Caucus. We do it almost every year. Um, it's uh, uh, a uh, sort of aftermath of the election. And of course, it's the Mass Women's Political Caucus, so I'm expecting there'll be a lot of folks being very upset with the, the results. Uh, and uh, Lauren is on board, and my buddy Andy Hiller, who's it will probably be his last, and um, let's see, I can't remember everybody. We have Hillary Chabot from, Hillary Chabot from um, yeah. The Herald, Cher Schoenberg from Mass Live, as well as Mike Dean from WGBH. Well, thank you both very much for being with us. Choice for okay. Bowling and Lauren Tuzensky.